Um, let us start with um, an introduction. The introduction will be by Tracy Manette. Uh, Tracy is a board member for the Canterbury Bank Sound Chamber of Commerce um, and within the realms of the BRAVE program, which is uh, an equality, um, we have a 50-50 gender board. Um, and uh, she's also the current chair of the Women's Committee. So Tracy, if you'd like to unmute and uh, welcome everybody today. Um, hello everybody, welcome to today's first webinar for the BRAVE project. Um, as before I start, I'd like to um, proceed with an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to, in the spirit of uh, reconciliation, the Canterbury Bankstown Chamber of Commerce acknowledges and collaborate, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. Further to that, I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of the Honourable Damien Tudorhoe, who's been a great supporter of our region and the Chamber in the past, and he has voluntarily come to this um, webinar because he is interested in our community as always, and we thank him for his time today. I'd also like to thank Bronwyn and Kylie, both from Women New South Wales, and I would um, just like to now move on and tell you a little bit about BRAVE. Uh, BRAVE for us is a movement. We're very inspired. We've called it the BRAVE project, but for us it's a much larger concept. Um, we have a vision of equality and breaking the glass ceiling. And in this series, our focus is aligning itself with the state government's strategic objectives, which are to help all the women and empower all the women in our um, community who are from so many diverse backgrounds, so many languages, religions, and we wish to um, help them return to work and break down some barriers, not only to start work or re-enter the workforce. In today's workshop, we're going to focus particularly on called women. That means, like I've just described, all these hundreds of countries that our people are from, we're trying to help them return to work after injury or disability. Um, I'd, like I said before, I'd like to thank Women New South Wales for the opportunity and also the National Disability Conference. Without them, this project wouldn't have been possible and we look forward to partnering with you in the future, but we're very excited to kick off today. Amazing, thank you so much, Tracy. Um, we'll be um, talking with Hayden. Hayden Payne is the owner and founder of Spectrumite. Um, he'll be speaking to us today from the perspective of disability and physical disability. We're also um, Sassy. Sassy uh, is a HR specialist. Um, she'll be talking to us today about nurturing an inclusive recruitment process. And we will also be delivering a free checklist. Um, and that's, to, that's beyond uh, the physical um, adjustments that a business might need to make in order to have someone with a disability or someone returning to work after injury. Um, it also includes some of the psychological elements as well. So um, there'll be um, the format today is um, some of our speakers will, will talk. Obviously, if you um, want to add a comment or, you know, you've got questions, um, there's a, um, you can put your hand up and, and we'll call to you. Um, this is a lunchtime break, so let's keep it really chill. Um, let's get to know one another. Um, let's open up the dialogue um, only through collaboration and open and friendly discussions. Um, can we really start to not only have an impact in the daily lives of the women that we seek to help, but we also need to start breaking down cultural barriers, bias and discrimination in our communities um, on a much bigger scale. So the Canterbury Bank Sound Chamber will be attacking the issue from every level possible and with the support of our committee, our volunteers um, and our partners, we believe that we can uh, uh, put a big dent in this issue and um, we're very excited to, to start today. Um, can we just start with um, a poll question? Now, Leah uh, is from the CBCC will be our administrator. 
um, as you know, with all of these things, we need to collect a little bit of data, um, but also to gauge um, where we're at and where we, where we move to and whether we were helpful at all. Um, because whatever happens today will also drive what happens tomorrow. The results, um, we think it's really fantastic that um, everybody wants to be part of the BRAVE movement. Um, like we said, with participation, um, we can start to shift our attitudes. Um, as we expected, we also know that there are chamber members um, that have joined up today whose job it is to find people um, employment places, and we know that that's important. As a community of business owners, uh, we know how there's many organisations that want access to us and, um, and to have us employ you or your participants from NDIS or wh whomever else you would care for. Um, this is our way of saying we, the Chamber, and our members are open to helping in this regard. Um, but many of our members want to know how uh, and uh, they'll be joining us uh, to find out how as well. We know Damien, good friend of mine. Um, uh, I'm going I'm to throw it open to you today, uh, Damien, and see uh, what brings you to us. I know you like to chat, but just remember, 45 minutes. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, uh, Joe. Uh, it, well, this is an important issue for government to deal with because one of the um, principal uh, problems in relation to uh, any workplace uh, where injury does occur is the manner and the speed with which we are able to get people uh, to return to work. Um, the return to work rates uh, uh, from eye care um, have been uh, um, well uh, stagnant uh, in terms of or intransigent in terms of their movability for a long period of time and what we need to do is, is get different solutions uh, for, and that's why these forums are so important, uh, different solutions for how do we transition people from potential, from injury uh, to return to work uh, in a way that uh, sometimes doesn't exacerbate the injury. One of the biggest problems that the government has uh, is dealing with mental health uh, as uh, a, a growing uh, subset of injuries, uh, which uh, seems to be uh, very, very difficult uh, to get people who are uh, off work through mental health injuries uh, to return to work. And that uh, is something that I think uh, uh, groups like uh, Chambers of Commerce um, and your Chamber of Commerce uh, should have some input into is how do we transition people uh, from mental health injuries uh, to a circumstances where they feel safe and uh, in the manner in which they can uh, return to their workplace. Thank you so much for that, Damien. Then you've come to the right place. Um, mm -hmm. This discussion is going to go there. Um, that topic will be covered uh, uh, in this session. In the next session, we'll be looking at uh, including workers that are coming off compensation. Um, but, you know, it, we're all suffering uh, I guess, over the last three years and, and even now through cost of living. So we'll definitely be uh, addressing not only those returning to work, but we're going to get some good stuff out in these sessions uh, later on with SASE um, around just even managing your existing workforce as well. Um, now, we're going to move on to Hayden Payne, uh, the founder of Spectrumite, um, and uh, he's also been a, a friend to the Chamber for quite some time. We, we first uh, met back in 2019 during Disability Week, and uh, we welcome him here today. Thank you, Hayden. Um, well, I'm the owner and operator of Spectrum Light Neurodiverse Experts. Uh, we provide a range of programs and services for neurodivergent individuals, primarily uh, adolescents, young adults with complex neurodivergent needs, supporting them to bypass their barriers and find success in employment, education, and in community. We also provide training to organizations and corporates to get the most out of the neurodivergent talent pool and support the neurodivergent employees and also provide training around disability and neurodivergent awareness. Um, you talked about uh, your story in regards to, so return to work for us today as a definition is we're looking at returning to work and gainful employment, uh, financial independence by way of um, either returning to a, a job 
but we're also including self-employment, so becoming financially viable. Um, Hayden, what was your story? Um, you know, you're a 30-something-year-old man and you've, uh, you're have you clearly born with autism. Um, what was your journey like to find a job? I'd say it was a very long and frustrating process of not only trying to find the appropriate job and position for my skill set, but also to appropriately advocate for myself, having a non-visible disability and um, accessibility needs, which are difficult to even quantify and explain, especially with regards to some of my executive functioning challenges and sensory needs. And what did you, what did the recruitment process um, work for you? Like most companies have a recruitment process. Did, did that help you get work? Not to retain it for any length of length of time. I've worked a range of quite strange and non-typical jobs over the years. Um, but I, fa I found that the, the most fat, the most valuable, the most sorry, the most viable pathway to sustainable um, sustainable financial independence for me was to start my own business. Okay, and how's that been? Amazing. Um, a lot of neurodivergent people are massively overrepresented as as, as entrepreneurs. Um, having my own business has given me the the, the time and control to provide my direct client services when I'm most capable of delivering them, considering that my capacity is variable. Um, I can work towards administration or non-custom orientated processes and, and, and procedures, marketing, for example, or, or professional writing when I'm not really in the best space to deliver direct client services. It just, it gives me options and the ability to work more effectively on my own terms and maximize and utilize my skills that would yeah. not be necessarily viable in a mainstream employment environment. Now, you mentioned that you, um, you're a peer mentor, so that is you work with other people with autism to get employment. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest barrier for people with autism entering the workforce? I would say the fact that so many of the supports and ways of thinking about autism as a condition that we provide in mainstream employment are outdated, non-individualised and honestly cookie cutter approaches. Um, it, it's often said that if you meet one person with autism, then you've met one person with autism. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to think we're all individual. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, do, you think, absolutely. do you think that businesses can do better? Well, absolutely. I mean, one of one of my services is is essentially working with businesses to support the neurodivergent employees to not just survive the workplace, but but to thrive in it and to find cost effective, appropriate, reasonable adjustments that enable the the person on the spectrum or with other neurodivergent conditions to not only be more effectively supported, but so that the employer can benefit to the hundred and ten percent of that person's ability to deliver their deliver the skills and, and and talents that um that that come from their their area of expertise and focuses I think, I think no i i 100 agree i mean recently um as you know um collaborate uh, my business where we've just purchased our own office space and we're looking at building that right now and at the design stage um we wanted to be accessible um we wanted the design to take into consideration future visitors and uh, future employees. And as you know, Hayden, we we made it, our relationship with you has made us more aware of the small things that we could do and the investment we could do in business design um, and our workplace design. And some of those features in our new office is we have primary and secondary lighting so that we can switch from primary white light into a warm or blue light and RGB. Uh, the other one is making, you know, we're paying extra to level up our floor to avoid any gaps and even flooring. And we're maintaining the one metre plus uh, circulation within the space. Not 100% of our office, though. 
is mm. accessible for people with mobility issues. But we did the maximum that low bearing walls would let us. Um, how important do you think it is for businesses that can take a, an opportunity to redesign their space and their mindset to accommodate people that may have disabilities um, as customers and as staff? Well, I think, I, I mean, I'm aware this is this this conversation is, is structured around re return to work and injury and supporting people with various conditions, but have to think of the meaning of the word access. Accessibility is a great general business concern because if you are in a position to provide services to a customer base, which another service may not be able to provide access to, then you're in a position to appropriately service them where other portions of the market may not be. And it can assist. <clears throat> Sorry, let's find my notes. Honestly, just 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 from a general service provision perspective, accessibility is a, it's a great consideration because the more options, channels, and pathways that you have to share, disseminate, and service and provide information in your products, mm. the more channels you have. I mean, I yeah. mean, think how many customers are you potentially excluding if your the, the process to acquire your service involves a drive, a walk over fifty meters, a set of stairs tight aisles that aren't work or a wheelchair friendly and a printed booklet in a technical language or small font and then a verbal interaction with a customer rep. Mm. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, uh, and I'm sure you agree that when we make considerations for future workers, um, we also have an added benefit of potentially inviting new customers into our businesses. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's 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 essentially the, the core part of disability oriented accessibility. You're allowing people to not only access your service, but access your service in a way which they find is appropriate for them. Mm. Um, well, we know that, you know, a lot of businesses are under a lot of strain and we know that inflation is um, putting a lot of pressure on the cost of goods and wages is one of those. You know, recently we've seen the government increase the minimum wage. We've seen them at the same time. They thought they should increase superannuation as well. Um, and uh, our cash flows are under an enormous amount of pressure. Um, there are, we know we need to bring in skilled migrants and Right now, there are 1.8 million women not working or underemployed. And within our community, um, are they even looking for employment? And in Canterbury Bankstown, which is, you know, a very successful monocultural um, community, there are still reasons that women aren't returning to work. And I know, for example, one of those is going to be, um, you know, not necessarily around injury and, and um, disability, you know, but, you know, whether it's been pregnancy or, or, or cancer or whether it's a cultural or they had children and now they, they can't get back into the workforce at the rate of pay that they were paying for. It's like starting again. Now, our series is going to address all of those types of things. But, you know, today we're talking about injury and disability, but not all injury is, you know, permanent um, so how how do you how do you think that by making adjustments for disability we're also helping other people with other needs from us? Like one of one of the side benefits of that is that we we, we essentially had to provide the op the opportunity and access for people to work from home. We had to change mm -hmm. the nature of our service delivery to accommodate people who physically could not leave their homes and. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, a lot of people with disabilities, especially related around mobility and, and community access, were suddenly able to compete on a more even playing field with the remote working environment um, because the, the disability is no longer presented and in position to an employer. That's probably a beautiful place to end in that yeah. what we one of the benefits of COVID was that we learned how to use technology uh, in order to be able to work remotely. And that could be an amazing benefit for women who are looking to return to work after injury or work through, through their injury, through their rehab, or um, just work from home generally. I think that's fantastic. We'll leave you now, Hayden, for a minute and we'll bring you back for question time. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to Sassy. 
Sassy as um, our HR specialist at the chamber, and we call on her from time to time. Um, I think the last time you did a live webinar was the very first episode of CBCC Live TV yes. during COVID. So welcome back. Uh, glad to have you still with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, I thought about this topic and I thought, what a great topic to talk to from a HR perspective. Um, obviously, we do a lot of recruitment as part of our jobs and um, part of our job also uh, includes, you know, making making sure that we have a workplace where well-being and health and safety um, and um, employee happiness is fostered. So I thought this was a great topic to start start from also. What I want to talk about today is building and nurturing inclusive recruitment practices. And I've broken it down into three sections, reasonable adjustments, which we have spoken about a little bit already, protected categories and legislative considerations, and advertising inclusively. Um, first of all, considering reasonable adjustments, this is something that you want to do before you even begin your recruitment campaign. So before you go out to advertise your workplace and your job as inclusive and um, talk about diversity and all these wonderful things in your advertising and um, promotional material, you should consider whether you can accommodate uh, all, all candidates. You should also, of course, consider that your environment and interview practices are accessible to all applicants who wish to interview with you before you go ahead. So it starts from well before you actually start advertising. Uh, there are certainly things that you can consider to make your recruitment process much more accessible. And it really starts from planning, from how you advertise, what type of language you're using in your adverts um, to make sure that you don't exclude um, unintentionally any anyone from the um, process. So what is reasonable? This will be different for everyone, of course. Modifications may be too expensive, uh, difficult or time consuming, which could result in what they call unjustifiable hardship. Um, obviously, in Jo's case, she's um, quite spoiled for choice at the moment in her um, build of her new premises because she's starting from beginning it's very easy for her to start thinking about um, how she can make her uh, premises accessible however an older building if we think about you know 50s 40s 40s 50s 60s build might be a little bit different we often see places you know two-story places that don't uh, have a lift for example uh, so we refer to adjustments you are able to make to other things as well here. So it's not just about environment, it's about the job tasks, the job location, access to the site or access to um, additional resources to enable the person to do the work. So first of all, of course, physical environment, very important because that's, that's the very basics of this topic, I think. Do you have wheelchair accessibility, for example? Is public transport port available? Do you offer work from home options? Um, what about your job hours? Are they flexible? Then we can talk about things like workflows or maybe a more fitting word, work design. Um, so think about things like breaks and fle the flexibility you can provide in the way that you do your work or deliver your services. So offering flexible hours or days is really a good place to start. Um, but uh, can you think beyond this? Things like uh, break times. Um, where that, where can you do the job from? Can you do the job from a quiet library, uh, home, uh, cafe, whatever it may be that works better for, for your applicants and for yourself? Uh, cost considerations, of course, are a consideration um, when deciding reasonability. So if you need to make some adjustments, there is a cost obviously involved. There is some support that you may be able to access um, to pay for these type of modifications. And you would need to, as I, as I mentioned, your scenarios are going to be different. So case by case basis, you would need to look into that. And the last one is support. And what do I mean about that one? Support, leadership support, for example, is the leadership team equipped to support a person returning back from extended period of absence from work? 
on the job training or external training, um, your person returning back from an extended period of time off might need some additional support. Technology, for example, who knew we would have things like chat, GPT and things like that <laughs> a couple of years ago. Um, so um, there's a lot, there's a lot to consider. Um, the other thing is about job design and um, support from leadership. Are there processes that you need to change or you can reasonably change to accommodate people with different needs and we have touched on a little bit so physical and um, psychological injury of course requires different considerations when it comes to return to work yeah well well you know at Canary Bankstown we like to ask the hard questions questions no one else wants to talk about um as as an I'm an employer and you yeah. know sometimes um and I'm hiring you know yep. um and I want to know okay what's what's reasonable because while we're tiptoeing around employees and all of their rights I know that a lot of my colleagues like my friends that also own their businesses and you know throughout the chamber we talk about these things that's why we come together people that understand what what we're going through how much we're paying in taxes, uh, how many of our staff are taking, you know, sick days to do, take mental health days. And my day, I'm Gen X. Uh, you suck it up and you go to work, <laughs> you know. And we've got this intergenerational difference, all these things we have to consider, changing laws, increasing this. Um, what's reasonable to expect of a small business owner? I mean, big corporates have massive infrastructures there to support thousands of workers but an organization like mine where we are five to eight people um it takes everything as it is just to manage staff every day what what yeah. where where's the lines here yeah are you asking joe in terms of you, you're probably not asking in terms of cost um but in I terms think of cost is the least important part and yet it's one of the things that disability employment services hammer home oh you're they're going to give you some money i don't want money i want good culture and high productivity and yeah. i want my customers to be happy and i want them to keep coming back for more um that's what i want you give me any worker any worker that can secure a good culture a high profitability and good customer service i don't care where you're from or what your background is i'll take you uh, HR point of view, as I mentioned earlier, the support that your leadership is able to provide, that, that consideration needs to go into your planning. So how much time can you dedicate? How much support can you, training, all these things that yeah. you need to think about before you bring um, someone new on board. But Hayden, Hayden's put his hand up to answer this one for you. Yeah, and that this is a this could be a sensitive topic for many for many people, both for business owners and for people with a disability, whether they are consumers or employees. But it is abs absolutely a necessary conversation to have. And unfortunately, there are barriers due to fears of potential discrimination from the business perspective. Can I reasonably meet this need? Do I even know what the needs are? Is it appropriate for me for me to even ask what the needs are? And conversely, employees with a disability are often feeling cagey about asking for reasonable and necessary adjustments because they feel that assumptions could be made about their ability to do the work or can the business afford to reasonably do this? So it, it's unfortunate that there are barriers from, from both perspectives often preventing these necessary conversations from being had. But in, in terms of the language and the line, so to speak, the, the line's going to vary from disability type, persons within that disability type. Some people with a disability are comfortable with outdated and to many people nowadays, extremely inappropriate language. And they actually <laughs> prefer those labels being used to the point where a third party observer might think, oh my God, this is completely unacceptable and, and beyond the pale. But if you've got an established relationship with that consumer and that's what they're comfortable in terms of the language being used, then fair enough. Mm. You did use language that ultimately makes everybody feel valued, supported, respected, and well, valued, supported, and respected. Yeah. Um, so, where we're just mindful of time. Sorry, um, guys. Damien said at the very beginning, you know, where we were looking at injury, you know, what is injury? 
you know, is injury, they've had a breakdown, you know, is injury that um, they've been the subject of domestic violence and they've been controlled for quite some time. You know, injury is a very broad term. Disability is as well. And some have support under, say, NDIS and a program, and therefore they have, you know, um, support workers and, and a machine behind them to help an employer make these adjustments. Um, you know, and, and then you've got people that are currently in your workforce or those that have left the workforce and now they're dealing with, you know, psych psychological issues around rejection or psychological issues um, around their worth. You know, um, I worked abroad for around four and a half years. Um, I left when I was 28. I came back when I was 32, just six months ago. Um, and I know that when I tried to get back into the Australian workforce, um, one of the recruitment things that prevented me from doing that was the word recent local experience. Now, when I left Australia and, and I went to Europe, I, I assure you I was working in a very sophisticated role, one of which um, doesn't even exist in this country. So when I returned just looking you know, for work, um, I believed that there was nothing I could do. And I had no injury <laughs> and I felt really deflated in a psychological that I could be as smart or as experienced as whatever, but these language of recent local experience, local means don't be a migrant. Recent means don't have a baby. You know, um, this language excludes women, especially for many different reasons. If you took time off because you got hit by a car, you don't have recent experience. You know, you took time off. You know, these these are not helping us. Sassy, yeah. you want to talk about inclusive language. Well, what about yeah. exclusive language? Yes. So uh, how do you recruit uh, without excluding an enormous amount of the talent pool. Um, there are so many things to think about. Um, obviously, advertising your position um, and the flexibility that, that you are willing to, to give is a good start. But check your language for things like Joe has just um, brought up. Asking for recent experience, you're going to exclude um, a number of applicants who most likely have the skills to do the job. They might have been on maternity leave or they might have had an injury and had six months off work. Um, it, be mindful not to um, use that type of language to exclude them. So there are actually online tools available as well to check your language accessibility. Um, there are a number of things like Gender Decoder, Microsoft Word has its own accessibility um, tool built in. These are just some examples. Talk about your advert, check it. Check it a few times. Um, keep the door open to all your applicants. And if your workplace truly isn't inclusive and accessible to all, put a statement on your advert that, that is, that's the case. That already invites people um, to apply with your company. Um, or you might post a video, a team video, or a link to your website which shows a diverse pool of um, workforce so and there are also um, things you can do you can actually do targeted recruitment as well so you might be doing targeted recruitment in dis uh, uh, targeting people um, who live with a disability for example uh, Australian Human Rights Commission actually publishes the guidelines on that type of activity now protected categories and advertising these are the the no-go zones in your advertising. So why are we talking about this? So employees and prospective employees, which are candidates, have the right to be free from discrimination based on these protected attributes. Uh, and you can clearly see here uh, family or carer's responsibility, pregnancy, um, physical or mental disability, age, these are all things um, 
that are protected categories. So when I talk to businesses in Canberra Banks Town, um, why, why bring on risk? Right? Why don't I just go, you know what, there's plenty of able body people out there. Why don't I just work on them? Um, and why bring risk in, risk of culture change, risk of legislation risk, risk of um, you know getting caught up in discrimination and PR. I get caught up in those kinds of things. My business is gone tomorrow. So why bring risk in? I think you I think in any employment relationship carries out an element of risk in it. Mm. You you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's probably very true. Yeah. And, and look, what we, are, <laughs> what we are looking, like, there, there's obviously a, a factor here where you need to uh, weigh up risk versus benefits. Mm. Uh, but at the core of it, being a good corporate citizen, um, tapping into a wider pool of candidates, Hmm. To me, it sounds like a bit of a yeah. uh, no-brainer. <laughs> Let me ask you something else. Um, you know, as a small business, I don't have an HR department um, and someone to protect me from myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, is an organisation like yours, um, are you a service that I can tap into only when yes. I need to? Yes. Because yes. you so, might find yes. you might find sometimes when employment services for those with disability or you know mm-hmm. trying to get people back into the workforce they they serving one master but then they're really not serving my interests I really don't think they are yeah. um, if I was open to taking on more risk or, or structured risk with supports and things like mm-hmm. that I can reach out to organisation how can you help me. Yeah, we can help you manage risk, obviously. And it does start from this recruitment process as we spoke. So there are things that um, you can do to make sure that the candidates that you're bringing in are the the right humans for you. And Mm. they have clear expectations of what the role is. So one important thing is um, when you're asking interview questions, for example, you need to uh, make it clear what the position is, what what is expected of the candidate. make sure that they can carry out the inherent requirements of of the role and obviously then it goes into your background checks and that could come in all different forms and no that's great very deep. Um, I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions um via poll uh, I really appreciate your participation um, the first one is coming now we want to know how many people here um come from a culturally linguistically diverse background and in the true nature of Canary Bank Sound, that's about right. <laughs> the question as well, your employment status is, I hope that um, over the life of um, our project, um, you know, we're only kicking off today and our members are an active um, and engaged community, but we also are going to be partnering with other groups. Um, New South Wales um, Women's Department is going to be helping connect us with other groups. We know that we're a white whale being an employer group and we we have and want to enable our members to participate in solving this problem and getting more women back into the workforce. What we saw at the very beginning is everyone wants to be part of the movement and as part of the movement, we're in positions of power uh, and we can make a difference tomorrow. You can and then we'll also be monitoring uh, the actual tangible outcomes our improvement has in place. Now, all right, we're coming to um, an end now. So, um, I understand if you need to drop off because we promised you a lunchtime, but does anyone have a, a, a question for us at all? A very informative session. Good on you. I believe that Wally has spoken to you and you'll be opening our new office, right? For sure. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, it's just in three weeks or six. We don't know. <laughs> okay. well, no, no. I'll, I'll look forward to it. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be sending you a checklist to your mailboxes. Please distribute it to as many possible people. We want them thinking about bringing them into their business or into their workplaces uh, or enabling them, at least from a cultural perspective. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Uh